I'm, I'm accustomed uh, for the last session of the conference that everyone's really ready to go, uh, but uh, it, it's great to see that uh, we still have a full house and uh, people are still talking, so thank you. Well, uh, uh, let me start by thanking uh, Michael and the, the center and the University of Michigan for uh, um, hosting us here. Uh, um, and a special shout out to uh, Karen and uh, Jenny and Christy for, for doing the hard work of keeping the, the trains on time. Um, uh, I'm gonna, uh, th this is a panel on, on uh, data integration and visualization, which is uh, a little bit of a, uh, an odd combination, but I, I think we're pulling it together here. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, uh, an anecdote, um, and, and then I'll, I'll have, uh, uh, just a couple of quick slides. Last year um, at this conference, I uh, uh, delivered a quip about uh, how in economics we think a lot about uh, information theory, uh, but uh, a, a big part of what we work on, especially at the OFR, is information reality. Uh, and uh, um, that's per particularly apt uh, for this conference. Um, where the theme is, is big data. Um, it's very much about the implementation issues. The anecdote is, uh, is how I got into this. So my training is in financial economics, uh, and I came to DC in 1999. I spent the better part of a decade um, uh, leading up to the crisis doing uh, data modeling for supervisory risk systems. And, and when I started uh, into that, uh, nobody told me that data modeling was a thing or that schema integration was a thing. Uh, um, uh, we sort of figured it out on our own, and I, I remember having uh, a series of epiphanies uh, a couple years in, because I, I, I was lazy, I would go to Google and see if uh, there were uh, um, maybe software packages or tricks uh, I, I could download. And, and <clears throat> the epiphany was that almost everything that we figured out um, on our uh, data modeling teams uh, were, uh, in fact, solved research problems, usually from computer science, sometimes from philosophy or uh, other fields. <clears throat> and uh, um, it gradually dawned on me that there is, in fact, uh, this whole other universe out there. Uh, um, and in, in the supervisory world, where we're dominated by lawyers and economists and, uh, and accountants, uh, we often don't see the, the, the data issues as research possibilities in themselves. Uh, and, and I think that's a big mistake. There, uh, yes, there is, uh, um, there is drudgery uh, in uh, uh, wrangling data, uh, but there are also really interesting, uh, hard, formally hard, uh, and, 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 and deep problems to, to be addressed. Um, so uh, let me introduce our panel quickly. Um, we've got uh, um, uh, four experts, a uh, very diverse team. So um, we are uh, um, trying to, to mix uh, uh, several different components of the information stack here. Uh, and uh, uh, one way to think about what we're doing is uh, to riff off of Zach's presentation from the, the last panel. Uh, uh, the uh, visualization is uh, a user-facing part of the information chain. Um, it uh, delivering the information to the, the human visual system. Uh, and at the other end, we've got sort of the raw data that's gotta be integrated. In the middle there somewhere, uh, in order for, for the visualization to work well, you've gotta have uh, some sort of stable abstractions uh, that the visual visuals can play off of, uh, and, and it's the job of data integration uh, to get you to that point uh, so the visualization uh, can do its thing. Uh, so uh, um, we're going to start uh, uh, our panel after me um, with Aurel Schubert, who is the uh, Director General for Statistics at the European Central Bank, um, and I uh, apologize for the typo in the, in the catalog. Uh, um, uh, he is not the director of general statistics. He's the director general of all statistics. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Amal Deshpand uh, uh, is a professor of computer science at the University of Maryland. Uh, um, uh, Peter Sarlin is an associate professor at Hanken University in Finland um, and uh, uh, also director at Risk Lab um, and uh, coincidentally a co-organizer of a uh, um, uh, a systemic risk conference every year in, in Helsinki. Um, and Margaret Varga uh, um, wears several hats. She's the, the, the chair of the NATO Exploratory Visual Analytics Test Group. 
Um, I think I got that right. Uh, visiting fellow at Oxford University and a director at CTRU, which is a, uh, a visualization consultancy. So. Oh, got to do this. Sorry. Uh, views and opinions expressed are those that the speaker do not necessarily represent official of our positions of policy. Okay. Done. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm just going to show uh, a, a couple of quick taxonomies um, from opposite ends of this stack uh, to, uh, uh, to try to frame the discussion and, uh, 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 if not convince you, it, it, it at least get you thinking uh, that there is some useful structure to these problems. Uh, so uh, uh, this is looking at the, the visualization end of things, and uh, um, there's, a, there's a paper footnoted there that Margaret, Margaret and I co-authored with uh, uh, <coughs> Vicky Lemieux and uh, William Wong. Uh, and one of the questions that the visualization folks uh, need to know is, is a requirements question. What are the tasks you're trying to achieve? And uh, in financial supervision, it's, uh, it's not like, uh, say, a, an airline flight simulator uh, where the, uh, for, for for an airplane, the, the, the tasks are so cut and dried that, uh, in, in fact, everything from takeoff to transit to landing can be done on autopilot, uh, a little bit like Google Cars. Uh, uh, the tasks in, in supervision are much messier. Um, uh, and, and, and so uh, the categories here are uh, much more general. Uh, but we, we boiled it down to, to four big things uh, uh, that are important tasks for where, where, where visualization can help. So uh, I'll just. Uh, uh, pick on the, the, the first two here, um, uh, sense making and decision making, to give you a sense of how this plays out in practice. So, sense making is uh, um, the, the sort of stuff that uh, we do in the research department, uh, um, uh, trying to take uh, raw data, undefined problems, and uh, uh, make sense of it, right? So, uh, you don't know uh, in advance where the uh, interesting patterns uh, lay, which uh, data points are, are noise, which are outliers, which are mistakes. Uh, you need to sift through it. And, and for visualization, uh, that implies you need uh, typically lots of detail um, and uh, lots of interactivity. Um, uh, the, uh, the next two steps, really, uh, um, decision making and rule making are very different. Uh, so for reasons of accountability, uh, you can't have uh, um, uh, typically a lot of unstable visualizations in the middle of the process uh, when the commission or the board or the committee or whoever it is uh, uh, comes together to make a decision. Uh, um, if, if there are visuals in the evidence uh, before them, everyone needs to see the same picture. Um, and it can't be a picture that uh, um, uh, responds to uh, individual input. It's got to be a fixed picture. And, and so the, uh, um, uh, the, the emphasis for sense making is on sort of technical requirements of being able to deliver a lot of information in different formats quickly. For decision making, uh, um, it's really on getting the abstractions right and, and, and delivering uh, uh, the, the key abstractions because you're not going to be able to uh, revise them after the fact. Um, Another breakdown, uh, these are just uh, four different types of financial stability data, um, numeric, geospatial, network, and text. You see that uh, um, uh, these four flavors uh, also end up with uh, four different uh, renderings. Um, one thing about visualization is you've got a human in the loop, um, by definition, and uh, um, uh, humans uh, are... Uh, much less constrained in the sorts of data they can ingest and uh, make sense of than, than machines. So there is a vast uh, uh, amount of flexibility in how you will render things, uh, and therefore uh, a vast amount of rope with which you can hang yourself. Uh, uh, but there, there, there's a literature on this stuff. Uh, um, there, there are good ways and bad ways to do it. Um, back at the other end, um, uh, this is uh, looking uh, more at the raw data. Uh, um, and uh, um, this again, we, we've got a, uh, if, uh, if this interests you, there's a, a footnote to a, a paper where you can get the full blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, that's uh, with, uh, with Jag and Luika Louis Rashid uh, on big data challenges in financial stability monitoring. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, uh, we boil the dimensions of financial data uh, at least at a high level, uh, down to coverage, frequency, granularity, and detail. Uh, 
Uh, coverage means what's the scope of institutions or markets uh, or portfolios that uh, you're going to you're going to measure. Uh, frequency is temporal frequency. Uh, uh, granularity and detail. Uh, there's uh, th this is an interesting distinction, I think. Uh, um, uh, granularity, uh, at least uh, as we use it, is uh, if you think about a, a database, refers to uh, disaggregation of the rows uh, of the database. Um, so. Uh, position level detail, which is something that Aurel will talk about, is uh, is very granular, and it's the way uh, supervision is headed. Uh, detail refers to the columns in the database. So what are the attributes you're going to collect uh, about each of these things that you're measuring? All right. Um, with, with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Aurel. Aurel has been, uh, and, and the ECB, have been doing uh, uh, really uh, neat things uh, with uh, financial data, and don't tell us about it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mark, and uh, good afternoon. And uh, thanks a lot for the invitation uh, to Dick, the OFR, and to the hosts of the uh, University of Michigan, and Michael and his team. So it was a uh, two very, very interesting and intensive days here. Now, big data conferences today you have almost every week somewhere around the world. And I, I was just thinking since the end of the summer, have, this is already the third one. <laughs> I've been at the end of uh, August in Dublin, a big, big data conference of the UN together with uh, Eurostat on, uh, on big data. Then two weeks ago in, in Ljubljana, the Slovenian statistical office together with, with Eurostat again on big data. Now the third one, but what is really different this time that it's now really about finance. I mean, the first two ones were basically in the area of the real economy on global positioning data of ships uh, for balance of payments purposes or using, as uh, some countries do in Europe now, uh, a telecom and uh, telecom operator data to allocate uh, tourism receipts in the balance of payments or, or things like using Google Trends for unemployment prediction or, or maybe part of the CPI done now via web scraping, etc. so these kind of things. But this time, finally, we arrive also in something that is really in the area of, of, of finance. Uh, now, what I, I want to do in the next uh, uh, 14 minutes left is really to give you a little bit an overview of several initiatives which are going on in the European Central Bank, uh, which fit to the topics here, which are, which you see, similar topics, similar challenges, related challenges. Um, uh, but they are very much from the practical side, how we try to, to, to address these challenges which uh, our users uh, uh, have uh, for us. And uh, there used to be the saying, if the U.S. sneezes, Europe catches a cold. Uh, now I would say, if the U U.S. sneezes, uh, we have pretty much similar symptoms. And you will see uh, some of the things are, are, are rather, rather similar, uh, as we have been discussing here. And I've just seen which direction. Oh, that's not yet my problem. Okay, thank, thanks. Uh, just quickly, maybe just as, as a little bit as a background. I mean, what is... Um, Initially, the European Central Bank was created to do for the monetary policy of the euro area. So there was only one purpose, to do monetary policy. And so, but it got very strong statistical function uh, by law, uh, allowed to collect its own data for its own purposes. Initially, it was only monetary policy. Now, with the crisis, the things have changed. Uh, first of all, in, by 2011, uh, the European Systemic Risk Board, what is the FSOC here, was created and the ECB was put in charge of doing all the statistical analytical work for, for them. And so we got uh, this new macroprudential uh, function. In, in addition, the macroprudential function of the ECB itself was extended. So we are supplying now them also with data. And since uh, 4th of November 2014, now also the banking supervision of the significant institutions, which is about 130 consolidated banking groups, is with the ECB. And now we are also supplying them uh, with all, all the data for banking supervision. So the, the, the whole uh, uh, scope of data collection has enormously uh, extended, has been enormously extended, and with that, the work of, of ECB statistics. 
Now, what, is about, what was also crucial in monetary policy today is not monetary policy 10 years ago, because initially the notion was that it's a homogeneous euro area. So you, was, you only needed the data for the euro area for decision making. And I remember having been till six years ago on the other side of the table, being told, you know, your national little Austrian data, you know, we are interested in the aggregates. And then you're, you're 3% of the aggregate. So that's not really uh, important. Now what has completely changed uh, with Greece, Cyprus, etc., uh, that there is no homogeneous euro area and the heterogeneity needs to be reflected in the data. You need the data for the heterogeneity. So the averages uh, and the aggregates no longer tell the story. You need a distribution, you need a tail, you, you have tail risks, etc. So that completely changed, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and what we are collecting, or it's changing, or complementary to what we used to do uh, um, traditionally, uh, we also have to uh, do now a much more what we call granular data, micro data, and I will mention some of these uh, initiatives in, 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 a, in a moment. So that is, I think, important to remember. So there are now these uh, new responsibilities, but there is this heterogeneity and also the market fragmentation. Just as one example, for instance, so we used to get the data on the country. So, the, for instance, uh, the loans of the Spanish banks overall. But in the meantime, what we found out is obviously Spanish banks, um, this is a very heterogeneous group. There are a few really world-class banks and there are a lot of zombie banks. And if, unless you understand that, you don't understand how the transmission mechanism of monetary policy works or, or doesn't work. Or in another case, uh, in, a, in a moment I'll come to that, uh, you know, money market broke down 2008, 2009, money market was drying out, the central bank took over basically the, uh, the function of the money market. But once you look into the micro data, you realize it only broke down for some completely. For some it got more expensive and others got liquidity more or less as before at similar prices. So that now you only know if you have this data, but this is absolutely crucial for decision making. And that's why it's also important that we are very close to the decision makers, to all three of them, so to speak, uh, basically in the same house, although physically now in three different houses, uh, being just too big for the big house. Um, but uh, so that the disclosedness uh, is, is very important. And so I will just uh, address a few of these, um, these initiatives. The first one, and going again back a few years ago, first of all, on the I remember on the 15th of September uh, 2008, a question to all central banks, uh, Lehman Brothers problems yesterday. How many Lehman papers are you holding in your country? Now, I was still on the other side of the, of the, of the fence, so to speak. It was pretty easy for Austria because we had already since 1991 a loan by loan as a security by security database. So it was a matter of 10, 15 minutes. You just had to know who is Lehman Brothers. And that leads back to LEI and these questions. But at least those <laughs> where Lehman was in the name, we knew immediately <laughs> what was the exposure of the Austrian banks, the Austrian insurances, or the Austrian households, or, or whoever. Many other countries said, what's the question? How, sh how should I answer the question? On what basis? We only have aggregated data. Or a few years later, uh, who is holding uh, Irish bonds? Who is holding Greek bonds? Who will be hurt by a cut, a haircut of, of Greek bonds? This could not be answered. Um, so now, fortunately, I can say now we can answer it a few years later. Why? Because we have two elements. So one element which was already started uh, many years ago, but now has reached uh, a maturity, which is, which is very good. One side is the supply side of security. So we have now a database, micro database on all securities which are held or traded in Europe. So it's somewhere up to 10 million securities, whether equity, uh, or, or bonds, etc. So we have all the issuers with all the reference data. You have it here. Who is the uh, the issuer? The name, the sector, the country. Is it fixed uh, variable? What is the outstanding amount? Uh, what's what's the price every day? The price information coming every day. So you have a very very rich database about the supply uh, of securities. And now, since the last. Um, uh, three years de facto, now we also have a security holder statistics database where you have uh, initially sector by sector. So how many of these ISINs or how many of those on the left side are held on the right side by French banks or by, by Italian households or by, 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 by the Irish government or whoever, so uh, according to the sector. So you have now very detailed uh, uh, holder data. So both sides are now, and that now 
Um, and then we are at the question of integration. These are two silos for the moment. And the big challenge now is to bring the two silos together so that the analyst goes to the machine and can look at the overall picture. Actually, the day before I came here, we had the first pilot presentation of our colleagues trying to bring the two things together, linking it to, and I'll come back to that in a moment, to our single data dictionary, that all the expressions are uh, 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 the same, or if they are not the same, the analyst immediately says, why is one defined differently than the other, and what is the difference? So really bringing the whole thing together, and bringing it together on the newly created, or new to be created, uh, analytical business intelligence platform. So this is uh, one, I think, uh, important initiative, and we have not only, and that has to be said, not only on the sectoral level, we have the security holding statistics, we also have it for the 26 largest banking groups, security by security. So if you want to know, not me, but uh, um, the supervisory board wants to know how many uh, bonds of a specific type uh, uh, Paribas is holding, we have this information now, and we will extend this to the 130 banking groups which are under the supervision of the ECB, but initially when we created this, it was created for financial stability purposes, and we took the 26 largest ones. Now we need 130 because that's under the perimeter of supervision. So that is one thing, big our part of, of uh, going long, as a security by security. But security is only one part of the balance sheet, and I'll go, uh, have to speed up a little bit. Uh, now, the, a few other things. So the one is, uh, I mentioned already that the money market. So the money market uh, was assumption that the money market broke down. It, the basic thing was we didn't know too much about the money market. So we have now... Uh, this money market statistical reporting, which is on the left side, which is daily reporting by f around 45,000 transactions every day from the money market counterparts with the LEI. Uh, what are the prices? What are the, the quantities? So we get this now since July, and now it's, 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 uh, it's very, very, very useful information already in the days. Uh, we already had it a little bit since April, so around the Brexit, it was already uh, a very crucial for, for, for our, our analysts. And coming now to data sharing, I just got uh, two hours ago the request that some um, Belgium, Belgium financial supervisor authorities want to have access to this data, so I don't know why, but we'll have to look at it. And then maybe another important area on the right-hand side, which is just in development, is now because one big thing of the balance sheet of the banks is obviously securities, but the biggest thing in Europe are loans. So a loan-by-loan -loan database, which comes under, under credit. So really a granular database where every loan to non-financial corporations above 25,000 euros will be recorded in a common database, a common data registry from about 2018 on. So we are talking about roughly 150 million loans uh, with about 90 different uh, attributes uh, from the LEI to, uh, to fixed variable rate, uh, who is the counterpart, uh, what are the securities, etc. So now whether this big data or not, uh, I just wrote an article about Anna Credit, I called it pretty big data. At least for us, it's pretty big. If you're used to working with aggregates where you had a a colleague who looked at it with 18 countries and say, but this one looks strange. Now you have 45,000 a day. You cannot look at it and say, this one looks strange. You need different uh, methods and different uh, uh, things. So it is pre pretty big data. So in order to make sense of it, uh, obviously we are uh, involved uh, quite a bit and we try to uh, promote the legal entity identifier. We're involved in the development of the UTI, the UPI. We have made our money market statistical reporting ISO compliant, and now the Bank of England uses the same uh, which we did, uh, which is very good. And maybe just on the legal entity identifier, just to say how uh, there is a, the EU prospectus directive in the moment uh, in, in, the, in Parliament and Council, so a directive about what needs to be published if you, have a, if you are issuing a bond. And the ECB, in its opinion, said there should be the LEI in there and the ISIN required, which was not in the proposition of the EU Commission. Now, in the meantime, after a lot, lot of discussions, it is now in the proposal of the Parliament and the Council, and hopefully it will, it will survive. But the Commission had not thought about it, but that's just how we try also to promote the, the LEI. So um, this is just looks a little bit complicated, but you're much more uh, used to much more complicated pictures as I've seen in the last two days. Here's just the idea, which was also mentioned uh, by, by, uh, by several of you, bringing industry on board when you develop new reporting requirements. And so it comes in our case under the name, which you have on the bottom of the first column, BIRD. 
the bank's integrated reporting dictionary. So what we did now with this new ANA credit, this loan by loan database, we sat down with the banks. We invited, first of all, the national central banks, we are, because we are not allowed to go directly to the banks, so via the national central banks. Seven of them said, yes, we, we, we go along. So we are sitting down for the next, last few months with 26 commercial banks and go through the regulation and try together define from your transactional systems where you give a loan, how do you get to the reporting? What kind of trend, data to take? What kind of transformations to do? And put this into a manual, which will be published soon. It's a purely voluntary thing, but it's kind of, I don't know, crowd intelligence. So it's the best. It has no legal stamp. It doesn't say that's the official ECB position, but it is the best uh, guess. Uh, and it will be used then. Uh, can be used by every other bank, it's a public good, and by all software companies who are working for banks, that's how we interpret how do you get from your transactional systems to the reporting to the authorities. And now the big challenge for all of these, and then I'll finish for the bank, is integrating all these things. We have developed in 18 years or 19 years now many, many different statistics, monetary, um, balance of payments, and now also granular data. But what, the, what is the value added? And now for two years, we now also have the banking supervisory data, which I didn't even mention yet. So the core rep, fin rep supervisory data for all the banks. So now the question is how to link the whole things together, because that's really the value added. And for that, you have to work on several layers. Namely, you have to work, first of all, like every, others have done, and we have done this too, uh, to develop an inventory, a data inventory. So two years ago, I asked one of my colleagues, can you find out, so does the ECB know what the ECB knows? <laughs> now, in the meantime, we have an inventory. It will be now improved. So I'm finishing. Then you need the semantics, <laughs> which is a common dictionary. And then you need the technology. And then you need a visualization at the end where everything can become brought together. So with that, um, I can uh, give you, I think, a quick overview of which we are going. And the next slide just shows you this, uh, this uh, platform at which we are developing, the, the front end. But I think um, to come to the end, you see the challenges are, are, are very, very similar. We are working on them. We don't have a, a big master plan. It is much more uh, step by step. Uh, not a big vision, but very concrete steps. But it all adds together, hopefully, exactly what the, what, the, what the policymakers need. So, and I'm looking forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Aurel. Uh, uh, so, Amol and uh, Peter both have presentations about the middle ground between uh, the input data and the, the visualization end. Uh, and uh, Amol will go first. <coughs> Okay. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Michael and, and Richard, for, for inviting me to this workshop. Uh, this has been a fascinating workshop to, to hear the perspective of, uh, of, uh, from so many different angles about uh, the kinds of problems that, that are there in, in finance and regulation. And so I am in uh, computer science. Um, I'm at University of Maryland. I work primarily on building data management systems, so sort of at the lower level where we are trying to support the process, uh, processes that are going on above. Uh, the data science processes, data analytics process, and my goal is really to understand how to build these platforms that will allow us to simplify the process of doing uh, uh, data science, uh, doing it in this new world where we have collaborations, lots of analysis, lots of machine learning, uh, and so on. So the purpose of my talk is, is basically twofold uh, in some sense. Uh, I want to highlight some of the sort of hard computer science research problems that are there. Uh, that we are working on, me and many of my colleagues are working on. And uh, also, in some sense, it's something for the users to watch out for. People who are sitting on top and are doing this analysis, there are some things that you might want to think about as you are doing your uh, analysis, as you are you know, taking your data sets, uh, wrangling them, processing them, and so on. Uh, some of these problems that I'm talking about are not going to be manifest immediately. There will be something that will come up like six months down the line or two years down the line when you are asked to understand what's going on. So <clears throat> at a high level, and we have seen a picture like this quite often. Like today's, uh, in today's big data world, uh, we are using data science uh, tools everywhere. Uh, in many of the case cases, the process looks something like this. You have a team of uh, collaborators who are working on trying to do something. They are fetching data from a whole bunch of different sources. They are integrating them together. They are cleaning them. 
Uh, they're applying different types of models to them. Uh, they're adding more data sets to it. Uh, different users are doing their own things. And at all this time, the data is continuously evolving. When we are moving towards a world where we are continuously getting updates literally every minute. So before you know it, across many, many analysis steps, across many users, you're going to end up with thousands and thousands of data sets. And that might be an oversimplification. Uh, if you really think about every step of the way, you probably have a much larger number of data sets. And managing those data sets in a, in a systematic manner is, is a fairly challenging problem. Right? So we have, we have tons of really good work on individual analysis steps. People know how to take one data set and extract really useful insights from it. But we don't have very good support for the rest of the process. We don't have very good support to keep track of what goes on and keep track of all the data sets that, that come out. So the contention is, the hypothesis for our work is that uh, the pain point has increasingly become the, the process, the managing the process itself, rather than uh, figuring out new algorithms for analyzing a specific data set. Not that that's not really important, but this part, the process, is, is kind of forgotten uh, in many cases. Uh, there is very little platform support for many of these steps. If you have done uh, data analysis, um, uh, you are kind of working with a file system. Maybe you store your data in Dropbox, Google Drive, to be able to share it. And generally speaking, you are on your own with respect to managing those data sets. Um, so some of the problems that come up uh, that also form research problems for us are there is massive redundancy across many versions of the data sets. And this can be a real problem for, especially for science data sets where uh, you do have really large data sets, and if you start keeping copies of those, you do run out of space, uh, even, in, even in today's world. Um, an analysis pipeline, so here I mean going from input data all the way to output data, is typically spread across many, many uh, different scripts. Uh, in some of it might be in some, some MATLAB script, there might be a, 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 a user interface tool being used for doing one step, and generally speaking, the actual end-to-end -end end -end, uh, pipeline is, is not there in one particular place, in most cases, unless you're very disciplined and uh, are willing to work with a specific set of tools. Uh, this makes it hard to identify bugs, errors, uh, analysis pipelines, uh, simple things like saying, okay, I did this and, and she did this, what's the difference between the two? Can actually be a fairly hard problem. Uh, information about uh, uh, how data sets evolved, which data sets or scripts were used to generate which data sets is often lost. Again, if you're, unless you're very disciplined, it's very difficult to keep track of these things. Right? And especially if you are doing uh, scripting with, with Python or R or something, you are changing one parameter here, rerunning the program, changing another parameter, rerunning the program. Almost no one keeps track of exactly what they're doing. Um, and it's, uh, this kind of makes it difficult to do what, what I call here forward and reverse reasoning. Uh, there are other terms for it. For instance, if you find an input error, can you identify which uh, uh, output records might be affected by it? And in fact, uh, alluded to some of these problems uh, in his presentation also. Another related problem is, how do you explain a specific result? Uh, this is especially tricky if you have this big black box machine learning algorithms, which are impossible to reverse, uh, reverse. So you point to a specific output and say, explain this output. Typically, you can't really do that uh, without doing it manually. Um, the second related problem here is that, that models are an uh, uh, integral part of data science. And uh, today we have moved from sort of traditional simple models uh, to, um, uh, to really big and complex models. Uh, so 20 years ago, we might have really fairly simple regression and other models. Uh, today we have models themselves that are billions of parameters uh, and, uh, and, and much more. Right? Um, and also, in many cases, these models are packaged together with the results uh, in the form of notebooks or uh, IPython notebooks or, or other similar, uh, similar tools. And uh, again, the similar type of problems that I mentioned sort of come up here. Managing these models, uh, uh, understanding what they're doing are, are, are very uh, difficult problems of, uh, that we need sort of more uh, work on. So our research uh, uh, here is sort of motivated by these problems. Uh, what we are uh, we have been building is uh, this platform that we call Data Hub. Uh, it's, a, it's a collaborative data science platform, uh, so there's joint work with uh, Sam Madden at uh, Aditya Parameshwaran. Uh, roughly speaking, and this is just a schematic of it, uh, we have quite a few different things that are going on in here. Roughly speaking, Data Hub is centered around data sets. So for us, the integral 
unit that we work with is, is a data set. And for us, the data set is immutable. So if you change the data set, you basically get a new data set. Right? And so for us, that's kind of the integral uh, unit at which we work with. And so Data Hub uh, has several different aspects to it. Uh, uh, a data set management system, which uh, allows you to import and search and query across data sets. Uh, a version control system, and in some sense, this is one of the harder research problems that we've been working on, is how do you build a version control system for data sets? And if you're familiar with Git or GitHub, uh, it's a similar problem, but for data sets, and I'm happy to talk about uh, why those two problems are quite uh, different from each other. Uh, we've been building uh, what we call a provenance database system. So it's a slightly separate unit uh, whose goal is to uh, capture provenance and dependency information uh, across data sets and try to do it as transparently as possible in that we don't want to inconvenience the, the developer or the modeler uh, and try to collect this information sort of underneath without really changing their workflow. Um, and then once we capture the data set, once we capture this provenance or other metadata, how do we do uh, interesting kinds of analysis on it? And that's been a major focus of our work at, uh, at, at Maryland. And then uh, Data Hub also consists of an app ecosystem that allows you to easily sort of borrow app or to buy apps from other people and apply them to your data sets to do interesting things, so which kind of can allow you to um, uh, reuse other people's work and, and so on. So uh, just a very brief summary. So this, this is kind of a more technical uh, uh, slide. Uh, the kinds of work we are, we are looking at, uh, we've been uh, uh, looking at the issues of uh, storage and retrieval. Uh, so as I mentioned, one of the hard problems here is if I have lots of versions of data sets, how do I uh, deal with them uh, from, a, from a data management perspective? And so we've been working on uh, systems and techniques and algorithms for doing that. Uh, we've been working on uh, sort of a query language and interfaces to look at this versioning and provenance information and uh, do different types of analysis on them. And then we've also been working on uh, lifecycle management of uh, large models with a specific focus on deep learning models. And again, here our goals are to understand how can we help, let's say, a computer vision modeler to simplify uh, their analysis process, their modeling process. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy to uh, talk uh, more about this at, at any point. We are certainly interested in hearing if uh, you think there are some uh, uh, ways that you know, we can solve your problems or you can tell us other problems that we haven't thought of. I would love to hear from you. Uh, I do unfortunately have to leave almost immediately after the panel, but um, I'm happy to talk. Uh, uh, so my contact, uh, my uh, web address is there, and uh, I would be very happy to talk uh, afterwards as well. So, thank you. Thank you, Amol. Uh, and uh, Peter Sharwan is next. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Mark, um, and thanks to the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Mark mentioned our, our conference on systemic risk analytics. Uh, we've organized it for two years now, and we've had the pleasure to have Mark there for uh, 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 both of these uh, uh, conferences. And, but despite having a, a, a sauna event in the social program, I think we can't compete with this conference. So it, it's, it's, it's really been a pleasure uh, uh, to see the sessions that you had uh, this morning. And I think uh, uh, to make a second reference to Mark, because that's uh, apparently what you're supposed to do, um, uh, I, I think this, this conference is, 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 is covering interdisciplinary research as well as Mark is in his own research. So it's been a pleasure to see both the, f the first, first panel on, on data sharing, and I think there will be a, a few connecting points to, to what I have here. Um, and then also the, the second panel on, uh, on uh, uh, analytics. Um, so my, my background is in computer science, and, and uh, um, I spent a few years at, 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 at central banks, and now I'm back in a, an economics faculty position at Hanken School of Economics. Um, uh, and I've been doing quite a lot of, of modeling and some visualization on the side. Um, now I'm, I'm basically 
connecting to um, some old work on, on interactive visualization uh, that, that we did basically at the same time as, as, as Mark and Margaret was, were, were doing their paper on, on um, uh, visual analytics in financial stability monitoring. And, and what we're bringing to that is, is annotatable dashboards. So the possibility to track, um, uh, track uh, experts' work around data. And this relates very much to the previous talk. It doesn't go that deep into the analytics process, but so the machine side, but stays more on the human side of the analysis process. Uh, now, if we relate to, if we relate to um, what Mark was covering in the beginning to basically various categories of, of uh, visualization, then uh, obviously we could, we could categorize them into sense-making, uh, uh, decision-making, and so forth. Now, basically, this is another way of, of, of saying the same thing. We have exploration, which is, which is basically focusing on sense-making, communication, which on the other hand um, is, is, is focusing more on, on telling a specific story. Now, usually in visualization, we, we, we are not at, at either end of, of this spectrum, um, but, but rather somewhere in the middle. And I think what, what David was showing previously in the morning was more towards the communication part, um, but, but not entirely just communication, but also allowing means to interact and explore to some extent. Um, on the other hand, what we have been doing and what, what I will be showcasing here is more towards the exploration part where, where you are you're deriving insights and, and you don't have a specific story to tell. Now, this is my perspective to data in general in, in macroprudential oversight and systemic risk analysis. And, and I, I think this has been covered a few times already, but, but um, um, and again, co co uh, co uh, uh, coincidence that the market has slide on, 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 on dimensions of, of the data. Now, basically, I'm viewing it similarly. We have entities, which is, would be large volume data. We have time, which would be high frequency data. We have variables, which would be high, which would be high dimensional data. These are the standard three dimensions of a data cube. Um, and, and what we're adding on top of this is, is the fourth dimension of interlinkages across entities. Um, and of course, these links then form networks. Uh, the size of the network depends on the number of entities. Obviously, you might have time-varying networks and you might have multi-layer networks. So you're, you're adding a, um, a full, a full uh, uh, second cube uh, through, through these networks. And this is the starting point that we take uh, uh, to visualization. Um, now, our, our previous work related to visualization was a SWIFT-funded project on, uh, which, which basically was coupling uh, risk communication to macroprudential oversight more generally and then visualization to risk communication in, in that context. And I won't, I won't go into the details of, of, of that, uh, um, let's say, somewhat boring review paper, but uh, what, what was the end product of that was uh, um, was a, a, an interactive visualization platform that was covering precisely the data cube that you saw previously. Um, and and co covering two traits of that that, that, that we, we judge that have not been covered uh, uh, as, as well as, as, as we thought should have. Um, and one is interactive visualization. Now this project started in 2013. At that point, uh, everyone wasn't doing interactive visuals. Now. Um, uh, now most most of us are, um, but at that point, let's say one of the references uh, uh, was uh, uh, ESRB's risk dashboard that was a, a, a 40, 40 page uh, 40 page uh, static PDF document, uh, and and uh, this obviously we would have wanted to to be seen as a as an interactive dashboard. Now a second trait of 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 the the big data that we've been talking about is that. We, 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 we judge that we need analytical, analytical visualizations, and, and this is yet another term uh, among all other um, visual analytics and information visualization terms, but what we basically mean with this is that we need, we need, we need ways to simplify, um, simplify the data that, that we're looking at, and, and eventually we're restricted by the, the capabilities of the human visual system to process data, so we can't process data even though we could visualize it, and most often we can't visualize big data because we're restricted by the pixels of um, the, the monitors that we're using. 
Um, so, so eventually we need various ways of reducing dimensionality and reducing data, and that's something we've been working on in the sort of machine learning arm of, of, our, of our work. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly go through what we have in, in the VisRisk platform, but you can find it online if you're interested at, at vis.risklab.fi. So we, we have basically three different um, sets of applications. Um, one focusing on standard plots. There's nothing really special with this. Here you see an example of a bank level early warning model, uh, which provides bank distress levels or distress probabilities. Here you see a Greek bank highlighted. You see the rest of the Greek banks in the background. And uh, if you would, uh, if you would uh, uh, deselect this filter, you would see all the European banks. Um, and likewise, you could, you could filter out various cross-sections and look at how cross-sectional distributions have evolved over time, or look at the entity and really drill down into all the variables that are explaining the distress levels for these banks at a specific point in time. So this is just slicing and dicing the standard three-dimensional data cube, nothing, nothing special to that. Now, essentially, this, uh, the, the maps category of, of applications that we have in, in, the, in, the, in the platform focuses on, on various ways of decreasing dimensionality and, and uh, reducing the, the volume of data. So here we are projecting uh, 14 financial stability indicators for 28 economies uh, globally um, for around 20 years, uh, quarterly data. With that, we are creating a two-dimensional display. The display represents four different financial stability states, pre-crisis, crisis, post-crisis, post and tranquil states. And based upon these 14 indicators, we can project uh, uh, these economies onto the map uh, um, and, and, and understand in, in all these dimensions their, their state of, of financial stability. Um, and the final category of, 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 of applications focuses on networks. And here you can see a, a, a Granger causality-based network which looks at CDS returns um, by billion others. And, and what you're seeing is linkages across banks, insurers, and uh, sovereigns. Um, and obviously, you have various ways of filtering this. You have various ways of rendering, so choosing different visuals to the same data. And at the bottom, you can see, uh, you can also follow the centrality measures um, uh, for, for specific nodes in this network. And what this essentially means is that now we are visualizing essentially um, all four dimensions of the data cube because the standard cells in the data cube are the centrali centrality measures at the bottom, um, whereas the linkages are um, in the top view. Okay, but, but eventually then, um, so we've worked, we worked on, 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 on these types of interactive visualization with a larger number of organizations, and we've seen how these organizations work around data. Among others, we worked on the, the mentioned securities holding statistics um, and provided a, a, a dashboard uh, for, for um, exploring that data set, which is a tremendously rich data set. Um, but then eventually, the main question after However much we are uh, uh, customizing uh, these, these interfaces, and they're not really solving the main challenge. So, um, uh, so basically what we say is that it was painful to see the work of experts build up into isolated knowledge silos due to the lack of proper tools for human interaction around data. And this is essentially what we are focusing on now. So we're ta basically taking these uh, visuals one step further to allow uh, humans to interact around data to track that and, and turn that into documented and structured uh, uh, data. Uh, so, so if we think of how we analyze data, we're quite often sitting uh, uh, behind a monitor where we may have means to interact the visuals that, that we're looking at. However, the analysis process um, is quite often also a social process. Now, now the question, the, the question, uh, the question is, is uh, um, how we how we are supporting that, and especially how we are tracking that. So this could be a realistic version of how you are interacting with others. You have various forms, uh, fragmented into several channel channels, um, and you're you're not tracking that precisely well. You might have bilateral emails and 
and, and uh, see seeing a large number of persons in your division, but nevertheless not providing a structured means to, to uh, document that knowledge. So that's, that's essentially what we're working on in, in what we call Silo Brain, which is a dashboard that connects organizations with the experts' work by allowing experts to speak directly to the data. So point to patterns, make annotations, and discuss with colleagues. And if you would sort of, in the information visualization or visual, visual analytics um, community, um, you have a large number of different mantras, like um, uh, the visual information seeking mantra, overview first, zoom and filter, details on demand. Now what we would say is that interact with visuals to find patterns, annotate data and discuss to elaborate, and then search on demand. And this search then uh, focuses on the metadata that you have been annotating with. So this is eventually how it could look like in case of a risk dashboard where you're just looking at time series of inflation, in this case for 28 global economies. On the right side panel, you basically just have a feed that is coupled to individual data points and provides additional metadata to um, these individual data points. And on the upper, upper left corner, um, you, you, you have your wiki, which is basically the full knowledge base around these data where you can filter and search. Um, and, and you have a feed that, that may either be based upon the, the people you're following or the data you're following. And so another application, so we, we're working with a number of central banks um, on, on this prototype that we've put together. And an, an, another example of this is a start, London-based startup called Almax Analytics that essentially is, is turning news, so textual data, into semantic networks of numerical facts. So Almax is doing event and value extraction from textual data and turning these uh, uh, numerical facts into semantic networks, which eventually, eventually then are, are turned into relevant indicators and, and, and are used to estimate the impacts on, on stock prices. Now, basically, what this, what this is creating is nothing else than standard networks. And here you can see um, a, a snapshot of a, a semantic network which connects a few um, st stocks or companies from the solar sector um, based upon their new project. So you can see that, for instance, Sun Edison is having a project in the large project in the US and a, a small project in South America. And you can see that there is an annotation coupled with this. Uh, by, for instance, an analyst, a portfolio manager, um, or say a, a, a trader that is, is, is getting the, the output of, of the Almax system. Okay, so with this, with this I'll, I'll end my, my part and I would be happy to sort of, uh, I would be happy to continue the discussion um, both uh, uh, after our presentations and I'll be available also after the conference. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Peter. Margaret Varga is next. It's been a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Mark, for, thank you, Mark, for inviting me and OFR as well as the Michigan Law School. I have enjoyed myself. Uh, mindful that I'm the last one. So I will do it swiftly. Uh, I'm the chairman for the NATO Exploratory Visual Visual Analytic Research Task Group. And so today I will go, want to show you some of the work that we do and how it applies to big data. Right. So uh, just one slide promise. Um, our work is to, uh, to work to research and promote the deployment of visual analytics techniques among NATO member and partner nations across a broad range of NATO application area. And so we're interested in developing and applying visual analytic tools to support situation awareness for a, a many different domains, uh, such as financial, aviation, healthcare, maritime, and cyber. It's multidisciplinary and also cross-domain. What I mean cross-domain is across the land, sea, air, space, and cyber domain. And we talk a lot about uh, reusability of data. We also look at reusability of technology. So we look at transferability of technology from one domain or one application domain to another domain. And this is very effective and extremely fruitful that by understanding the insight and knowledge about one domain, we can apply it into different domains. 
and uh, uh, so cross-domain um, uh, discipline is also extremely useful. So big data, we all know, is a huge volume and high velocity. They also are uh, not only very variable in a variety of in different forms, and that there are elements of uncertainty and veracity and also variability in nature. And, but we also need to ask ourselves, what is the value to us? Is it relevant to us? So why do we want to show data visually? Well, we create data, data every day. Even our uh, goldfish has data associated with it. And uh, so it creates a few of uh, study the data science uh, and changes how we actually conduct uh, research, uh, understanding in physics, chemistry, aviation, and finance. And it is a quantitative record of the real world. By visualization, human vision is the highest bandwidth that we think visually. Uh, we do it all the time. It's very fast, it's, par par it's parallel. We're very good at pa recognizing patterns. We're also very good at detecting changes. It's also pre-attentive, which is something we do without even thinking about it. And vision helps us also extend our memory and also increase our cognitive capacity. So let us have a look at what do I mean by pre-attentive. This is pre-attentive, just using color. You can immediately spot the red spot. And this is hardwired in our brain. We don't have to learn about it. So here's another simple example using different shape. Why are we interested in pre-attentive attributes? Because pre-attentive attributes are things that pop out immediately. If we know which attributes or features are pre-attentive, applying in our visualization to our display, that will improve the effectiveness of our visualization. We explore data is to gain insight from the data. This help us make decisions based on the data, but also help us form or change our opinion about important issues. We learn from what is going on and discover new phenomena. So Richard Hamming said, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. And uh, Stuart Carr, Jock McKinley, and uh, Ben Seidemann said, the use of computer supported interactive visual representation of data to amplify cognition. The challenges we have are how do we transform the data into information that enable to understand and derive insight, make it useful. Given the data, how do we make people, let people understand the phenomena? So what we're aiming at is the light bulb moment. Aha, I know now. So the insight is that the goal for visualization is to give us insight, not give us pretty pictures. Sometimes I would say that you want to see something that is actually useful help you discover something you don't expect, explain to you what is happening, be aware of the situation so that you can make informed decisions. These are some examples of the work we have done in uh, looking at financial data, in aviation uh, safety, in uh, cyber security and sentiment analysis, in maritime domain. So just, uh, David told me to give you some pictures, so I do that. <laughs> <laughs> So in financial situation awareness, why is it important? Because it may help us make, us, help us make informed decisions for maintaining stability and mitigating risk. There are various different risks. We have compliance risk, we have credit risk, we have operational risk, we also have cyber risk. And it's a continual operation. So we need to know the nature of the financial services, the availability, the confidentiality, the operation and infrastructure. And very often we are reactive, but more importantly, we also need to be proactive to make predictions of potential states and vulnerabilities. The challenge is how do we analyze, integrate, which we have discussed here uh, to, uh, in this conference, and then present the massive amount of the data uh, from multi-sources, uh, big data, so that in a tra trackable, tractable, comprehensible, and usable manner. So in order for us to maintain situation awareness for financial stability, we need to know how a situation has developed, how it might, may progress or may change, and predict, predict what might happen. However, traditional approaches are shown to be very inadequate to make sense of this big data being challenged. So visual analytics offer a possible solution. So Peter mentioned visual analytics, so I will just uh, have a brief uh, 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 introduction about visual analytics. What is visual analytics? Visual analytics is the science of analytical reasoning facilitated by interactive visual interface. It actually combines automated analysis technique uh, with interactive visualization. So to give, make us 
easy to understand, reason, and making decision on very big data set. So it enabled the analysts to fully utilize their cognitive and perceptive ability to support making very, using some advanced computational capability so that we can understand the data, the situation, and making a timely decision. It is multidisciplinary uh, visual analytics. So this is the scope of visual analytics. So first component is visualization. Visualization makes out of information analytics, geospatial analytics, and science analytics. The second component is human factor. Human factor is very important because it makes the link between the computer and, and the human. After all, the system being displayed, the targeted audience is human. So we need to understand what makes it effective, how to interact. And so we need to understand the cognitive and perceptual so elements of the user. And so we have to produce some useful summary and presenting it so we can disseminate the result, analytical result, to the intended audience. And finally, it's supported by the data analysis. It's about it exploiting and benefiting for data management and knowledge representation, knowledge discovery, and statistical analytics. The difference between visualization and visual analytics is this part, is the data analytic part. Visualization has interaction and visualization, and uh, uh, visualization, but visual analytics also have the data analytic part. So in visual analytics, we are looking at three uh, categories, visualization, hypothesis analysis, and exploratory analysis. What is visualization? We, our starting point is we know in advance what we want to, uh, want to present. So we decide on what appropriate presentation we can use. What we get is a very high quality visualization of the data to show the fact that we're interested in. In hypothesis analysis, we started some hypothesis about the situation, whether there's issue about credit, and then we proceed very goal-oriented to prove or, uh, uh, or uh, dispute the hypothesis. So our outcome is uh, visualization of the data to help us confirm or refute the hypothesis. Exploratory analysis is very much the basic issues, problem, is we don't have hypothesis about data because we don't really know about the data. Neither do we know very well about the problems. So the process is we interactively and directive search for some structures, trends, and patterns. What we get the outcome is a visualization of data that leads us to one step up for hypothesis and visualization. So in exploratory visual analytics, we explore and exploit real data to answer the W questions what, where, who, when, and which, so that we can understand the why. So we want to detect the expected, but more importantly, to discover the unexpected in trends, pattern, behavior, anomalies, or weak point, uh, so that we can uh, support uh, making informed decisions. So the critical aspect is that we need to know our problems. We need to know our data. Don't let bad data ruin your analysis of visualization, and also know your analysis. Don't let bad analysis lead you to wrong floor suboptimal decision. And you, finally, you need to know your user, what they want to do, what are their tasks. So we start with data, follow with the uh, algorithm, and then we visualize, and the uh, user perceptions are interacting with it. User will interact with both the visualization, the algorithm you use, and the data to decide if there is a data gap. And this takes time and effort, and there's no magic button. So we're interested in the user-centered visual analytic, not the data-driven analytic. We want to focus on the user, what they do, and the decision need, and the skill, and the mental model. In the financial visualization, um, most user interfaces use, uh, show statistics and aggregation using line chart, bar chart, graph, network, geospatial representation. Is it, would it be a good time for us to now consider developing some other visualization to meet the different needs, tasks, and decisions in the financial sector. So for example, here we have different visualization of the same situation. The first one is, sorry, the first one on the left is Sankey to show the flow of the information. The middle one is also show, show the flow information using a stack uh, donut, and then we use tree map, and also pack bubble. They're all showing the same thing using the same data. The, the, the decision is, to make, to, is governed by the user. What does the user want? What sort of data? Which is the most effective representation for the user? We can also use, look at dependency and relationship graph as well. Um, so everyone, uh, so 
So having said that, I want to just show you, we do use this new technique we have. Uh, so we have, this is a cybersecurity, because to, uh, third, many people have mentioned cybersecurity. So on the left is a thank you, look at the left hand side, the green is in, uh, internal host, right hand side, the red is external host. Uh, incoming traffic is brown, outgoing is uh, blue, there's not much outgoing there. And then we also have uh, double um, uh, dual bar chart, and we show all the different things and the uh, geograph. So we can see that it may be useful for credit flow, uh, debt flow, uh, 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 other um, uh, entities. And so just to show that, that we have used it for uh, looking at uh, um, uh, post scan. So there is an external uh, IP scanning of one per uh, site. And people were talking about um, DDoS. So this is an example of DDoS. It's uh, multiple external catching it. So I will bet. So advantage that I would also like to thank people. We will not be able to uh, have this um, interactive approaches to visually explore big data without uh, the advances of uh, database uh, that allow us to be able to filter aggregate on billions of documents in near real time. So last one, promise. Uh, so we need to decide which data set and sources are relevant and, and that will help us enhance our situation awareness applicable to multiple purpose, uh, purposes. But we also need to be mindful about the origin, the provenance, the trustworthiness, the value, and the relevance of the external data sources. And we must avoid data-rich and information-poor situation. So as Herbert Simon said, the information consumes the attention of its recipient. Hence, the wealth of information actually creates a paucity of attention. So let us focus our attention. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And we have uh, time for some questions. Um, I'll, uh, I'll kick things off with a question for uh, Aurel. Um, uh, Aurel, you talked about the, the uses of the data uh, for monetary policy. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, um, uh, it must arise that the requirements for monetary policy and the requirements for financial stability uh, um, uh, sometimes come into, into tension. Uh, how do you decide uh, uh, in the statistics group uh, how, to, how to address uh, those trade-offs? I, th I think, Amanda, um, the kind of data Today, which, uh, which the colleagues want, both in monetary policy and financial stability, basically, more or less, uh, there is a convergence here. They want more or less the same information. So, for instance, uh, uh, also with uh, uh, initially for monetary policy purposes, we only collected the, the, the aggregates, the country aggregates, and produced like M3 out of it and this. And, but then with the crisis came then the demands for individual data and so we get in the meantime at least for 300 banks for the biggest ones uh, also individual loan data etc so broken down the balance sheet more in detail because one thing i should have said that i mean it's clear uh, the aggregates are based on on individual data but the individual data or bank by bank data is uh, the ownership is with the national central banks we only get the aggregates but now since the crisis, and we also get now uh, what we call individual balance sheet data, individual interest rate data. And that again, that is extremely interesting also for, for, the, for, the, for the financial stability colleagues. So, so it, and what is more, maybe the challenge is then simply uh, where to put the limited resources if you have competing demands. And for that, uh, last week the board decided to in implement a so-called data committee which then in the future will help us to set priorities so it's not always us to have to say uh, who, who, who gets what priority but but there is increasingly the demand um, that all analysts want to have uh, more or less the same data well like this money market data was created specifically for the markets people the treasury people so, so they're in the treasury department um, uh, but immediately the demands came immediately uh, from economics, from research, from, from risk management, from financial stability, everybody wants to have. So there is more and more that uh, uh, all analysts want to look at everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to follow up on that. And then uh, I see Michael's got a question. The, the uh, um, 
so, so I'm, I'm imagining that the, the, the monetary policy folks are going to be most interested in, in uh, the exposures and statistics on banks and, and, and the money market. Uh, things like hedge funds or uh, um, the securitization markets would be secondary for them. Um, is, is that the case? Um, there, there. I mean, the focus is, is as you say correctly, uh, not always always exactly the same what they are looking at. But it's it's always interesting if you tell then your board member that they want to have access to the energy. Why? Why in the world do they need this? <laughs> so there is always a questioning why somebody uh, need, needs something. But I think overall, uh, everybody wants to look at, have a more what is called now holistic picture. So so look at look at everything because potentially, as it was said, information or interesting information can be in places you didn't think about before. So that in that sense, uh, and we try not to discriminate as long as the need to know principle and then the access rights uh, legally are, are okay. Uh, Margaret, this is really uh, following up on your last comment, um, the end of your presentation about the interaction between the presentation of information and mental bandwidth. So I think uh, sometimes we have this uh, mental model that the human being who's experiencing this visualization is the same at uh, all time periods. But we know that when information is maybe uh, most needed urgently in the visualization format, our brains are in a different place. We're in the middle of a crisis. And so in a crisis moment, we have our, our bandwidth has shrunk dramatically. We have other psychological phenomena we know that, that uh, scarce bandwidth causes tunneling and other phenomena. So how should we think about the choices in visualization technique in these very different time periods, the uh, you know, semi-normal time and the uh, crisis time in terms of the psychological factors that are at play in the human brain? We are working on a, a framework uh, for uh, data visual, for visualization to look at the follow the, um, the the workflow of the analysts in when they because this dashboard we want we look at the order of sequences and also look at simulated data simulation case studies to see where if it is under you have to now make this decision in two seconds where would they go and then identify what are the salient attributes that make them make the decision. So in many ways, we need to look at weighting the data. Not all data are of equal importance under different circumstances, which is more important to make the decision. So that is almost like condensing further instead of exploring is now decision-oriented. So that would be uh, the, the goal for being able to monitor and make snap decisions when, uh, because for example, cyber is very quick. Thing happen immediately. So uh, proactive, and if we can have predictions, for example, like post scanning is a reconnaissance. Can we do some prediction in prepare for something like that? So that's, I hope I answered your question. I have a question for Peter Sarlin. I, I like the dashboards that you showed. Could you give us some examples of humans interacting with the dashboard and what it improved specifically in the, in the finance or um, such domains? Because uh, you know, I, I, I come from Ford Motor Company. We are now showing uh, results as dashboards, but we don't usually let people interact with the dashboards. Um, yeah, so uh, I think, say, if we, if we take examples from, uh, so I could take a very concrete example. I used to be with, uh, with the ECB in, in uh, DG Macroprudential Policy working on financial stability surveillance. And what we spent most of the time uh, on was writing long reports. Uh, and we hoped that several people would read them, but in, 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 in most cases, unfortunately, several people didn't read them. Um, and, uh, and this is a way to basically move our analysis process into, in a sense, unstructured uh, data. Whereas what, what I would be proposing with this is that we, we would be documenting um, our analysis process and structuring it by annotating it directly into data and allowing then 
that information to be distributed in an organization through pull and push functions. So either sort of vertically in an organization, um, say from up in the pyramid, uh, 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 pulling from the bottom or, or, um, or then distributing it horizontally um, by having uh, uh, colleagues working on similar concepts, uh, um, sharing their, their expertise. Um, Directly, so I think I think this is this is the idea. I mean, annotating the dashboard is more precisely just annotating individual data, and that structures our knowledge. Um, I, I could have a, a short note on the the previous question by Michael. Um, I, I think this relates a bit to to um, the the question that we had at the end of the the, the keynote. Um, where, um, where historical relationships and uh, anomalies were related to each other. So in a sense, in a sense I, I think visual analytics oftentimes relates to some extent on a model, and this model might relate on, to historical relationships. And now this doesn't allow really your mind to shift in, in that way, because in a sense you are doing analysis based on historical relationships. On the other hand, there might be cases where you can't rely on historical data, and then you might be interested in outliers or other anomalies, and, and, and that's, that's just a different case. My question is directed to Mr. Schubert. Um, what is your assessment of the compliance in, in among European countries, well, no, among European institutions, specifically in insurance and finance business? Uh, what is your assessment of their compliance with the first pillar of solvency, which became effective this year? or uh, they're equivalent to the directive of Basel III. So if, if I understand correctly, then you're, you're referring now to, to the Solvency II directive, which yes, I mean, the Solvency II directive is, is the insurance, basically the Basel, Basel III for insurances. And in that sense, it's so that the ECB and financial stability has its own needs for, for insurance data. And so what we did in cooperation with the EOPA, with the European Insurance and Occupational Pension Authority, we developed the reporting of the ECB in, in addition to the, to the supervisor reporting for Solvency II. So we added, uh, we used, uh, we also had XBRL uh, uh, coding of, of, of this reporting, but we only got the first reporting uh, um, six weeks ago or so. So we are still looking at the quality and uh, we'll, uh, we, we intend to publish it uh, by early next year and by um, next, next month to give it first time to the analysts. So we are still working in the, in the, in the quality area, but I know from EOPA that there are, there are challenges like all, all completely new reportings especially the insurance industry was not so used to be a heavy reporter, uh, to say it uh, politely. So it's, it's a big change. So there are uh, challenges, but uh, we are working on them. So it's too early to say anything about the, the quality of the data. I cannot say. Hey, um, my name is Sri Lakshmi, and uh, my question to the panel is, let's say we have historical data and we are able to visualize in the best possible way. How much of this data in your experience has helped in forward-looking analysis in, in specific context to finance? Like, I assume, I mean, we all say, we all know history is not a representation of future, but the idea of visualization and model fitting is all, all about what can we say about the future. Uh, what, what, is, what would be your answer? Or do you think it's not useful or anything? Uh, I guess I w um, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's necessarily all about the future. That's uh, certainly um, uh, being able to predict uh, um, is wonderful. Um, uh, very helpful. 
uh, but it's not the, uh, um, the only assignment we've got. So uh, um, being able to, to understand so situational awareness of an evolving crisis uh, um, is, is a crucial task in itself. If uh, uh, in, 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 in the space of an hour or two hours you can get oriented to uh, uh, which markets, uh, which institutions are the source of the instability, uh, um, uh, that could be enormously helpful. Um, and uh, um, uh, backward-looking analysis is a, a very different assignment, uh, um, but also very important. So doing a forensic analysis of uh, what happened during the crisis uh, um, uh, typically uh, I involves uh, um, uh, much more detail and granularity uh, to, to sort of piece to, together uh, what was the sequence of events and, and, and uh, you know, how did the... Uh, if you ever see uh, um, uh, documentaries of the NTSB um, after a plane crash, um, tiny little uh, uh, fragments of the airplane are assembled in, in a hangar, uh, and they spend weeks uh, diagnosing uh, exactly which part failed. Um, and and uh, it, it, it's a different sort of analysis, but, uh, but very valuable. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure whether um, visualization really is the, the key concept here. Um, if, if we would take Mark's uh, categorization of sense making, rule making, decision making, and so forth, I think we could have these objectives without visualization. We could just be looking at numbers. Um, uh, visualization is just a way to, to make use of the human visual system in the loop, uh, in, in addition to, say, machines and other, other type of, of, of um, ways of rendering data. Thank you. Um, so picking up a bit on what Michael was asking about being in the right frame of mind um, to really take in the visualizations, um, you know, Many of them are very beautiful, but frankly, the average Joe is going, would have a hard time interpreting what they're seeing. And I, I think very much about, let's say, some of the ways that I'm looking to use these data visualizations, let's say, with the bank examiners, et cetera, that are generally coming from a very, very different um, frame of mind. And I think a little bit of back to um, you know, the, the, the treaty that was signed around um, road signals and, and road signs and how there was a global agreement in terms of how these rules of the road were going to be visualized. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about um, any emerging agreement in terms of these visual conventions that would be helpful, I think, you know, in, in the future in terms of people learning to understand what these visualizations are about. Margaret, do you want to talk about the, the upcoming uh, uh, meeting in Dayton? I'll show you an example that given the same data, there are so many different ways of visualizing it. And that's why it's important to govern by the user perspective and what the user is trying to do. So only the user can decide. So the problem here is that there is no guidance at the moment uh, for what is the most effective one. And that sometimes is personal preference than what they used to. That's why we're still using bar chart, pie chart, and line chart, because this is I mean, I've been agreeing with it, but we want to look at breaking the mold to look at introducing new visualization that would be more effective and how do we measure the measure of effectiveness. And that is looking at a lot of the cognitive science human factors in identifying the salient points in what make them change, what make them accept it, because we are human beings, we're very reluctant to change. I'm very happy with the, what I do. Why do I want to change? What is it in it with me? Unless the benefit can be shown to them very um, noticeably, they, they would not want to change. And that's why understanding the mental model and their way of working would change how visualization would be able to improve the current uh, uh, achievement. All right. 
question here. If I could follow up on that point, uh, you may have seen that the Museum of Modern Art in New York has just adopted as part of its collection the original uh, group of emoticons that were created for uh, mobile phones, I guess. Uh, and so my question is, a couple of the presenters touched on this briefly. Um, presumably, one of the reasons why we are interested in visualization is because, as a matter of psychology, visual intelligence is perhaps the most direct way of reaching individuals and conveying understanding. Um, and I guess the twofold things that I would think about are, first of all, um, are you looking at research that's done by social scientists with regard to uh, the effectiveness of visual means of communicating information? And secondly, um, is there a uh, uh, possibility that uh, graphic designers might have some role to play in this context? Um, yeah, so I, I think also relating to the, the pre previous question, this is this is really, I mean, in finance, we would be concerned with financial literacy. In, in, in visualization, you're concerned with data literacy, and, and, and these standards are evolving, and they are evolving, uh, say, much faster than they've evolved previously. But, but of course, um, um, a lot of this that you've, you've seen here would probably not be um, then for the, 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 the group of people that you might be designing visuals for. Um, and and that's, that's, I think that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, I think a lot of the research, uh, Margaret might know more about this, but a lot of the research behind um, visual analytics, and, and it was called information visualization before, and this newer term, um, but, but essentially the same thing. Um, but a lot of that research is, is biological research, uh, so it's just, just related to how our, our human visual system functions. But of course there is a role for social sciences uh, obviously as well, but I guess that relates to data in, in general and how we interpret and understand data. Um, um, but, but I think biological research is something that we specifically need to, need to understand if, if we are to understand um, say, visual variables and how we are to use various visual variables. And, and this you also talked about. The human factor element, the cognition and con per perception, uh, that under different circumstances, they're different. But not only that, different people have different way of working as well. And it's through knowledge and experience that that would be different as well. We are at the end of uh, our allotted time. Um, if there's one more question, we'll take it. Um, otherwise, let's thank our panelists. Well, before everyone leaves, um, let me just say, first of all, thank you again uh, to the University of Michigan. This is a great uh, pleasure for us to do this. Uh, I hope this won't be the last uh, of our interdisciplinary conferences. This particular focus on uh, big data, on accessibility, on quality, uh, and on scope, I think, is an important topic. Um, we've only begun to uh, really get into some of the, uh, the issues here. And the important thing here is that it's not just about the technology, it's not just about the data themselves, but it's about uh, all of the uh, disciplines that interact with the use of our data and the distribution of our data and the way that we make them available to people uh, for use and to try to explain what we're, uh, what we're doing either as policymakers or as researchers or as people who are interested in having, uh, in this case, um, uh, a stable and strong financial system. 
Um, so uh, I really want to thank everybody for coming and for participating. Uh, and I hope the next year's topic, if it is next year, will be um, equally interesting. Uh, there are a lot of takeaways from this conference. I know that we're going to be writing up. There's a conference volume that's coming out from last year's conference um, in preparation. Uh, and there'll be a lot of good takeaways from this conference. So just thanks, everybody, for coming and for participating and for making this a terrific conference. Thank you all. <laughs>